Welcome to the 396th episode of the Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast. My name is Jamie Delaney and I'm your host. I'm a plant-based cardiologist and endurance athlete living in Southwest Florida. Welcome and thanks for listening. Hot and human training in Florida. Um, training for, I guess the next event will be a mar- trail marathon in Texas, followed by a swim run in Texas, followed by the CIM marathon. So lots to do to start to bump up the training right now. Um, just kind of getting in some base miles and some heat acclimation. I have been watching the Badwater 135 ultra race over the past 48 hours. Um, yeah, 48 hours on uh, the live feed. Badwater is an ultra marathon that's a road marathon. Starts out in Death Valley. Temperature is about 110 degrees. Ends up on Mount Whitney 135 miles later. Um, Harvey Lewis, that was on the podcast before, and his fiance Kelly uh, both ran. Uh, Harvey got fourth place. Kelly finished respectively. And there were nine people from Florida that raced, and one in particular, um, he is the oldest man to finish um, the Badwater 135 at 77. His name is Bob Becker. He is a race director down here in Florida, and uh, I'm working on getting a time slot so that we can interview. Uh, I take, have a chat with him because I think it'll be fabulous. Um, you know, if you're on Instagram, you should go on over and do Badwater, uh, search Badwater and see um, Bob's finish. Uh, obviously make links to all that when um, the, the, the when I interview Bob. But, um, you know, just really exciting to watch people go through the various checkpoints over the 48 hours. Um, you know, it's, it's unbelievable, uh, the mental will and determination of these people and, you know, terribly hot, de- hot uh, conditions followed by, you know, vertical climbs that are just unbelievable. So uh, it was a great thing to watch. Certainly made me... You know, want to be a wannabe. I don't know that it's ever a for me thing, but it's uh, certainly made me uh, want to push the, the distance a little bit longer. It made me want to take better care of myself, if possibly, so that I can continue to run. That's my goal, uh, is to continue to run as long as I possibly can. Maybe I'll get to tow, tow the line at 77 in Badwater. Who knows? Um, but, um, you know, that's that's what I train for and try um, to live my healthiest. And I, uh, part of this podcast is to share what I learn with you, uh, because certainly, um, my evolution as a physician has changed drastically over the years and it continues to change. And sometimes it can be a little discouraging. Um, you know, in the old days of regular medicine, just titrating medications and doing procedures, um, pretty much same thing happened. You know, there was a finite number of choices, finite number of thinking. And I've always said that my medical judgment is based on can I make somebody live longer or can I make them live better if not longer? And that has really been called into question. Um, and it seems to be getting worse and worse um, as far as what that exactly means. Because part of my job is to present the evidence to my patients or members, and ultimately they make the decision for themselves what is best for them, and I support them in that decision. And now as I evolve more into, um, you know, actually maybe having more time to look at the data and what's been done because my practice is slower, I have more time to think, um, it becomes less and less clear and more and more confusing because there are a lot of choices. Um, I've got myself into somewhat of a, you know, uh, I'm an allo- a trained allopathic MD physician, um, but I also believe in a lot of um, naturopathic uh, and alternative type of uh, methods for treating people, the biggest one being diet and exercise. And the more I look, um, it's, you know, the allopathic way, there are a lot of, um, it's not that the path is not near as clear. Um, certainly the side effects of some of the treatments and medications become uh, more, um, more apparent uh, when you actually have time to look 
deeper into the therapies. And it's, it's not, not necessarily easy. Things that I was sure that caused things in the past, I'm not so sure. Things that I thought were clear treatments in the past, I'm not so sure that were, were clear treatments. And, you know, so it, it, it's a lot more uh, digging. I always try to approach someone as if I would do it. And, you know, I, I am 100% plant-based. I don't use oils um, because that's what I believe in. Uh, I believe in exercise. I exercise. So I am not um, one of those physicians that say you should do this, but then I don't do it. I'm not one of those physicians that says to do something on the Internet um, but don't do that in my daily practice. So I, I'm pretty much true to what I say, um, but that truth uh, tends to be moving a little bit, I guess, or a little bit more complicated than it, than it used to be. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. For instance, chemotherapeutic drugs. Uh, there was a study published uh, in the Journal of American Medical Association looking at neuropathy. And you know, just about everybody knows that there's side effects with chemotherapy. Uh, most people know somebody that's had chemotherapy and they, um, you know, they may have gotten sick. They may have lost their hair. Uh, certainly they were, they were fatigued. Um, and the idea of traditional chemotherapy in the past has been give somebody enough drug that it kills the cancer cells and the person can survive it so that uh, there's enough of the good cells left that the person can survive the therapy and hopefully the cancer's gone and certainly that's evolved with some different care therapy cancer uh, chemotherapies some are more targeted towards uh, the actual uh, abnormality in the cancer cell um, certainly they're better anti-nausea medicines um, but there's still a lot of side effects and a lot of times oncologists don't really talk about that. Um, you know, cancer is a scary thing. Um, probably if people knew how many potential side effects there were with some of the therapies, maybe a lot more people would say no um, just for fear, and maybe that, maybe that wouldn't be a good thing. Um, and, you know, I heard an interview with a very well, uh, well-respected well-renowned uh, breast cancer oncologist at San Francisco. And, you know, he, he also, looking back on his career, is about my age, maybe uh, a little bit older. And, you know, the things that uh, a lot of, you know, there's a fair number of people that have to get treated and you have successes, but there's also a lot of failures and a lot of people get injured and hurt over the time and it's a very difficult situation for them. Um, so if you, you know, if you just talked about the negative things, uh, certainly life would be a lot harder. But anyway, in this study in the American Medical Association, they looked at about 4,000 patients in a meta review. So they, they looked at a bunch of studies, uh, and they looked at neuropathies. And, uh, when I say neuropathies, it's, um, typically like any neuropathy typically involves the hands and the feet. It can be tingling, pain, cold sensitivity. People can't tolerate cold, can't tolerate hot, um, numbness, clumsiness, um, again, pain to walk, pain to grab things, dropping things, and it can be acute. Um, 68% of um, chemotherapeutic drugs resulted in a neuropathy in the first month. 30% of those persisted at six months, and they could affect people uh, daily activities such as dressing, you know, buttoning button shirts, uh, tying shoes, cooking, walking, um, people that have neuropathy, two times as many falls as um, people their own age, you, you know, uh, compared. Um, an overall physical decline because of not being able to exercise and do things because of the neuropathy. Um, it seems as though the, the dose is dose dependent. Um, also, um, if, if the neuropathy is more chronic, um, it's associated with the, to the cumulative toxic effect. So the more chemotherapeutic agents that one gets, the more toxins that they can get. It can, it can progress from the toes up the leg, from the fingers up the arms. Um, it's more associated with some of the medications, the taxanes, paxitaxel, the platinums, um, 
some alkaloids, vincristin, uh, vincristin um, some of the protosome inhibitors. Um, and these are chemotherapies that are used to treat breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, lymphomas, melanomas, and ovarian cancer. So it's not isolated to rare cancers by any stretch of the imagination. So a fair amount of people have this happen to them and there's not really an effective treatment. It can be lifelong. Um, and so it is more of dealing with the disability after the fact than it is on, uh, there's no real effective treatment to make the discomfort go away. And, um, you know, sometimes it would be nice if people knew uh, that they could at least prepare or that, you know, a, a lot of uh, patients aren't really, they, they say they have the neuropathy and uh, maybe oncologists don't really admit uh, that it was the chemotherapeutic drug, so maybe it was the cancer or the treatment there. But, you know, it's, it's this is a well-known fact as far as this neuropathy. And I think, you know, uh, obviously uh, the paper concludes that we need to screen more and help people to, you know, uh, afterwards deal with the disability. But I also think that up front um, people need to know uh, that this is a potential side effect that could occur and how might um, the physician um, that gave the drug help them through that. And then that's not always the case. Um, it's not always the case in other specialties as well. Um, a lot of people get joint replacement. Florida is the capital joint replacements um, of the world, probably. Uh, we have more older people that need joint replacements, not runners. Uh, it's typically people that are overweight that have a lot of risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, maybe coronary artery disease. They see an orthopedic surgeon and I say, yeah, we can fix your knee or we can fix your hip, um, but they don't talk about the rest of them. So the mechanical aspect of putting a new replacement joint in is fairly straightforward and mostly successful in getting it in, but it's the post-operative period of bleeding, infection, uh, how much range of motion do you get back, the risk of pneumonia, the risk of anesthesia, all these other things that could be better dealt with if the patient was more healthy going into some of these surgeries. Um, and so just because we can doesn't mean we should in a lot of these surgeries. And, and I'm pretty much a stickler for my patients that I want them to actually be in good shape before they go in for some of these joint replacements. And I don't think, you know, um, I had an orthopedic surgeon, very good orthopedic surgeon, say to a patient this week that, well, you're not that big. And, you know, we do a lot of other people that are bigger, and certainly there are bigger people in the waiting room. And it's like, yes, but that doesn't make it right. And that doesn't make it optimal. And, you know, so if we're going to do treatments to people that have adverse consequences or risk associated them with, we need to deal with them and, and maximize a patient's um, you know, how well they're doing beforehand. You know, perhaps, you know, if people were, um, you know, if people that had cancer were healthier before they start the chemotherapy from other ways, could that, you know, would that change the neuropathy or is it just the toxins of the drug? We do screen for, um, you know, some of the cancer drugs can cause cardiomyopathy. So we screen to see if people's heart function is poor to start with, which increased the risk. Um, but, you know, it becomes, well, we have to do these therapies because this is what we have. And, you know, I heard this, this again, this physician speak that it's very difficult for a doctor, whether it be an oncologist or a orthopedic surgeon or a cardiologist to say, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to watch this. Uh, because as physicians, we're taught to do something. Um, and it's a lot easier when people are sick. So if somebody's having a heart attack, it's not hard for, at all for me to um, do a heart catheterization. If they're having a very slow heart rate, it's not hard for me at all to suggest we do a pacemaker because there are things we have to do because the person is going to do worse if we don't do it. But when someone doesn't have any symptoms or they feel well, then that really complicates the decision tree because back to my original line of discussion. If they already feel better, can I make them feel better, live longer with the therapy? Will they come out, will they survive the other end? Will they survive and be better or will they just survive? Have I decreased their life expectancy by doing something? And I think a lot of those things we don't know. 
Um, and that's the discussion I would like to see both sides of the allopathic, the naturopathic, you know, go. And I, I don't know that it, that ever will. Um, um, you know, I've had some discussions of, of late. Um, if a um, if somebody doesn't undergo a, a, a um, what I would say would be the treatment, the accepted treatment, uh, and things don't go as well as they do for when it goes well in the accepted treatment, um, you know, was it a failure or, you know, was that, is, was the person going to have a, 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 an adverse response anyway? So it's, it's never as easy as, um, this is what you have, this is what you do. Um, there's always a backside to everything. And I would encourage you to discuss that with your physician uh, if you have an upcoming treatment. Uh, I, would just, I would encourage you to look at the literature um, and ask questions. Uh, because if a physician can't take time to answer those questions, then you're probably not in the right location. And if a physician doesn't have time to maximize your health before a procedure, then you're probably not in the right place. So you're listening to this plant-based wellness podcast, and most of you probably are plant-based or certainly thinking about becoming plant-based. And, you know, just to kind of go over that really quick, um, plant-based versus vegan, um, you know, there are beyond beef burgers. There are all kinds of prepackaged foods out there that are vegan. Um, They don't harm any animals. Uh, They're made to taste like the animal counterparts, you know, chicken Fingers, fingered uh, fish sticks, like I said, Beyond Burgers, all kinds of things. They typically have the same fat, salt, maybe even more salt, oil content that their animal product counterpart has. Um, It might even be worse because a lot of the oils are processed oils that um, are high in omega-6s, which are very inflammatory. So a vegan diet is not really um, better a lot of times than a standard American diet. It can be just as, you know, just as much junk food um, and hard to navigate. So a lot of times people think they're eating healthy, but they're really not. So when I talk about a plant-based diet or a way of life, I'm talking about eating, you know, fruits and vegetables and whole grains that haven't been processed to the point where you don't recognize them. Um, so beans, you know, rice, quinoa, farro, barley, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, uh, every vegetable in the sun, greens, um, you know, we, we know greens produce nitric oxide, greens have chlorophyll, tons of antioxidants, so uh, you can't eat too many greens. I don't think anybody will argue that regardless of what diet that they, they follow, um, but fruit um, yeah, in, in the whole form, not juiced. Um, I, I'm okay with vegetable juices to up your game. Uh, and sometimes people put maybe an apple in them, but when people start juicing, you know, uh, more more fruit than than a vegetable, then you just start getting in a high calorie drink that doesn't have any fiber in it. Um, so I'm I'm for chewing your food as much as possible, um, but then again, you know, if we're trying to really maximize somebody's anti-inflammatory status, uh, maximize their nutrients if they have cancer or they're coming back from a surgery then some green juices uh, or blended uh, drinks, you know, might very well be in order. Um, I don't use processed oils. Um, I know that in some places, olive oil might have some benefits, um, certainly used in sparing amounts. There's no need for it. We, we don't need oil, um, uh, olive oil to, to survive. We need omega threes, which we can, uh, which are essential fatty acids that uh, we can get from hemp, chia, flaxseed, um, beans, greens. So uh, it's more of trying to get rid of some of the omega sixes that are more pro-inflammatory, pro-clotting, uh, and back down on those. And those seem seem to come into the processed oils, uh, seed oils, and particularly nuts and seeds. So when people eat a diet heavy in nuts and seeds, they can be really inflammatory, uh, and it can be very calorie dense because. Fats have nine calories per gram versus protein and carbohydrate have four calories per gram. So if the more you process food, the more you smash it, take the fiber out, um, squeeze it into a little container, um, the the more calorie dense you get. So guacamole is much more calorie dense than an avocado because you can stuff three or four avocados into a little container and add all kinds of fillers and label it guacamole and it's healthy. Uh, A lot of people do avocado toast 
um, which you know is billed as a health food um, for little kids uh, that are growing and need extra fat. It's probably a good thing for adults once in a while, but not with guacamole that you buy that has oil and salt and everything else added to it. You know, so I'm for slicing an avocado and placing it or smashing it a little bit onto a piece of toast, but not. Uh, making guacamole with, you know, that you have no control over the amount of calories that you're getting. So that's kind of where I am on, you know, what plant-based and what I do for my nutrition. I eat um, the predominantly fruit in the morning with some chia seeds, a piece of sourdough toast. Um, uh, on the, on, it's during sometimes, lunch is usually a giant salad, uh, maybe some leftovers, usually a grain. I don't do, I'm not that big of a person, so I, I don't usually do beans and rice at lunchtime unless it's a leftover, and then I portion control that. But greens, vegetables, and fruit are my, my go-to. Um, the other things are, uh, are ancillary. And dinner, I usually do a cooked meal, a soup, uh, potatoes, grains, uh, or just something simple like, um, you know, last night was green beans, mushrooms, uh, sweet potato, and a salad. Um, and because I didn't have any beans last night, uh, other than the green beans, which are much less, um, um, dense than say a regular pinto bean or black beans, I did do, uh, a dressing that had a little bit of plain almond milk yogurt, um, with that, uh, and some nutritional yeast. So it varies, uh, but a lot of times I keep it simple. Tonight we had a, um, a soup with potatoes and carrots and celery, um, and a leek, um, and a salad. So, you know, a lot of nights, uh, more simple than not. I do do pizza, but I make my own, do my own crust. But again, fruits, uh, huge. It's mango season. Um, it's coming to an end. Unfortunately, we just have a few left on the trees, but I have a lot, uh, to process and to freeze and to bag. So, um, you know, mangoes are great down here right now. Of course, we've had watermelons and papayas and dragon fruits. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful place to live as far as to, to get your fruit, I often hear people tell me that they gained weight because they ate too much fruit, and it's just not so. I often have people tell me their glucose is high because they ate too much fruit, uh, or they ate too late. It's just not true. Uh, it's the other thing. So, you know, just like when you get sick and the last thing you ate, you blame. Um, the last thing people mem- remember eating uh, or snacking on, they blame. So they blame the grapes. They, bl- they blame the watermelon. It's not true. Um, it is the other more caloric dense things that you ate beforehand that drives the sugar, drives the weight um, that we tend to kind of forget. But if you look, you know, beyond that, you know, um, if you look at exercise, again, we talked last week that clearly most people don't get the bare minimum of exercise needed. Um, certainly Bob Becker did at 135 miles and 48 hours and 47 minutes, but most people don't. Um, do you need 48 hours straight of exercise? No. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I'd like to see most of my members getting an hour of cardiovascular exercise a day, um, you know, with a rest day now and then. Um, you know, it brings up the idea of am I injured um, or am I just in pain and have discomfort from possibly a little overuse? Um, and, and, you know, that drives a lot of people to quit, um, especially in running. People say, my knees hurt when I run. Typically, it's a running form or shoes that cause the problem or just starting out and they overdid it. A lot of people go out and run too fast, too far, too quick. Um, so, I, you know, I like to start people with intervals. But if you have an injury, um, you know, a buddy of mine used to say, just keep going. Sooner or later, it will go away. Um, a lot of injuries are like that. I mean, obviously bone fractures sticking out your leg, you know, that's something you've got to take care of. But, um, a lot of, um, uh, even fractures, we know now that we don't want people to lay off completely. We once, you know, a lot of, um, orthopedics will have people wait bare depending on where the, the, the fracture is after it's either been, um, uh, pinned or, or stabilized. So, um, the, old way of just having people go to bed with an orthopedic injury or even a heart attack. We used to put people together. It's not, not what you want to do. Move it or lose it. Uh, motion is lotion. And, um, you know, find something different that you can do while a particular area is um, causing you discomfort. Uh, and then, you know, as soon as the acute injury kind of goes away, then start range of motion uh, to keep that moving and then gradually build up to, to you know, to weight bearing. But, um, 
there are very few things that people have to stop and not do anything. Um, there's usually something you can do. Um, and if, you know, again, get outside, it's my, my, um, I'll transition into, into that right now. Um, one of my members was in the office and she said, you know, I know you like, you know, you're not a gym person. You like, you like the outside and I like the outside for a variety of reasons. Um, I like to get fresh air. I, I like the, the, the microbes that you, you get the sun to hear the birds. I think it's more peaceful. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think being out, um, is just, um, better for your head. Um, you can focus, you can think if you're in a crowded gym with noise and music and all kinds, I don't think you, you can really get the peace and the, uh, what that you they typically need, um, when you're out exercising. But a lot of people are worried about sun and, um, and it's particularly melanoma. Um, melanoma, it can be a devastating form of skin cancer uh, that can kill you. Um, there are a lot of therapies now that people are very responsive to. Um, melanoma doesn't occur in a vacuum. Uh, it doesn't occur because you got necessarily because you got sunburned when you were eight uh, on vacation, really bad, and you're doomed. Um, there's a whole host of factors. Most of the studies, and then the other two forms of cancer, squamous and, and basal cell, which rarely um, result in death. Um, so they can be dealt with on a local um, excision usually. But it doesn't mean that we should avoid sun. Um, the reality of it is, since we have become sun phobic, there has been a, uh, there was one study that looked at breast cancer and when a literature review was done there was actually a 17 percent increase in breast cancer during 1991 to 1992 uh, that was also associated with a uh, big anti-sun advisory the beginning of sunscreen availability and trends towards everybody applying uh, sunscreens if you look at cancers that are caused by um, diet, or I'm sorry, vitamin D deficiency, cancer rates can vary from 20 to 65 percent, with 138,000 U.S. fatalities because of vitamin D deficiency potential, versus 0.3 uh, percent, perhaps increase in fatalities with over sun exposure. And even if you look at a review of the literature and say, okay, is it when you were you exposed when you were little? Um, are you fair? Where do you live? And it's not near as cut and dry as you would think that it is. Um, a few studies and a lot of people came to conclusion. And you know, the, again, we get back to the drug companies and supplying sunscreens to dermatologists and saying, "Hey, if you put this on, you're going to bro- block," you know. 70% of UV light, and so therefore your patients won't get skin cancer. It's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, as a dermatologist, then you can say, well, if you use sunscreen, you're not going to get skin cancer. I mean, if you don't use sunscreen, you're going to get skin cancer. It seems like that would just be what you do. Why argue it? But again, the reality of it is the sunscreen have, the sunscreens, um, um, 80% of them have toxic carcinogen chemicals involved in them, and, it's, and most of them, a lot of them are absorbed by the skin. And so you, you end up with a toxicity that may very well induce some other forms of cancer or uh, inflammation in the body or autoimmune diseases. So it's not quite as simple as just put sunscreen on and avoid skin cancer. And the etiology behind the DNA damage, so it's thought that the UV radiation causes different kinds of DNA damage that results in different kinds of melanoma and the different kinds of DNA damage are associated with when people were exposed. So if they have a chronic exposure versus a short exposure, a young age exposure, uh, whether you're, you're fair. So the, the, the target of what UV radiation does to who, when is a moving target. And then there's this baseline vitamin D enhances immune function. So if we're blocking, you know, so vitamin D does have some benefits. Sunlight directly um, is taken up by the optic nerve, which results in a stimulation of 
Milan stimulating hormone by the pituitary gland that actually decreases the risk of skin cancer. So there are some studies out there that say maybe sunglasses aren't really helping as much as we thought they were. You know, we all wear sunglasses, especially in Florida, try to prevent cataract, the question of macular degeneration. But is that really true either? Or are there underlying effects? Is it just that everybody has high cholesterol, overweight, and smokes, and then they wear their sunglasses and they get and we blame the sun? So nothing, nothing happens in a vacuum. Um, and to say that, you know, if we wear sunglasses and sunscreen, we're going to be all right is probably pretty far from the truth. So, uh, you know, so I am an advocate of, and we do know that regular, gradual sun exposure induces melan, melanocytes and increases color and decreases the, the chance of getting uh, skin cancer. So getting out and getting little bits at a time, especially early in the season, um, is actually protective against sunscreen, sun can, sun, I'm sorry, skin cancer. And allows you to get your vitamin D that, D that improves your immune function. So, uh, you know, um, again, I think that getting outside and, and not being so sun phobic um, is much more beneficial than, you know, exercising in a gym that um, has not had a window or door open in six months. You know, um, talk about people that are spreading, you know, germs and microbes that aren't necessarily healthy ones. So what are the kind of toxins can you, can you avoid? You know, right up front, uh, I look at water, um, bottled water that's been sitting in plastic, you know, in the sun is probably not the best way to go. So uh, one of the best things you can do is to invest in a water treatment for your house, uh, at least a filtration, uh, reverse osmosis. I actually have a, a, a water distiller. Um, storage, storing your food uh, in glass containers versus plastic containers. Most people know not to microwave um, in plastic. I've, I saw a doctor, I, I said this on a podcast a long time ago, but I walked in the doctor's lounge and the guy was microwaving his scrambled eggs on a styrofoam plate. And I was like, what are you doing? You know, um, but people don't think. Because they think it's just going to be, you know, 10 or 15 seconds, but you're just releasing toxins. So when these plastics heat up and these chemicals heat up, um, they're absorbed right into the food, you know, keeping aluminum off of your food that when, you're, when you're heating it. Uh, again, using cookware that's not Teflon, that's either uh, ceramic or stainless steel or glass. Uh, staying away from genetically modified food, eating organic um, you know, the, the biggest thing I, I, I can't stand is pesticides and people spraying their yards. You know, thank God around here they, they usually put a sign up that, you know, they're advertising that, you know, Truly Nolan or somebody else, True Green or whoever, just sprayed their yard. Um, so I can make sure that we stay way clear of the grass. I don't let my dog walk in it. And if you haven't thought about that, you don't want your dog walking in treated, treated grass. Um, it's, there's a lot of carcinogens that come from that for, for our animals. Um, think about the birds, think about the food supply, the water runoff. Um, so pull weeds, use vinegar, something non-toxic. I use, um, uh, I don't use any DEET as far as, um, insect spray. I use a natural, um, essential oil, peppermint type thing. Wonderside, I'm not sponsored by them, but Wonderside is a good product uh, for my dogs and myself. So I spray it. Smells good. Peppermint oil, neem oil for plants, as opposed to um, you know chemical pesticides and herbicides. So you know we can think about ourselves, but we also need to think about the environment. You know, people that eat fish are are uh, exposed to a whole wide range of mercury, uh, PCBs, dioxins that are that are that are run that run off things that eat the fish. Um, again, uh, is exposed. So you want to, you know, avoid that, um, you know, artificial dyes that are in, in processed food to get back to the cereal aisle with what our kids are exposed to. So not only genetically modified grains, but their, um, dyes and all kinds of other things, uh, MSGs and, uh, synthetic fragment, fragrance, fragrances, um, you know, the air fresheners, the Glade, the plug-ins, all, all toxic fabric softeners, dryer sheets, 
Um, look at your toothpaste, your deodorant. You know, those are all things that you can do to decrease your toxic exposure. Hair dyes, hair lotions. Um, hairdressers have uh, one of the highest occupations of breast cancer because they're exposed to hair dyes, and there's none that are safe. Um, not, you know, they, even the short-acting ones um, are still uh, absorbed into the skin. There's so many conveniences that we have or things that we have in our home that we don't realize uh, are, um, you know, a, a problem. Shower curtains, plastic, you know, plastic curtains, things, you know, that's when they get hot. Uh, you hear this, the smell, all those things are, are toxic. One of the things, um, you know, in addition to vitamin D, uh, being associated with increased risk of rickets, bone disease, cancer, heart disease, osteoporosis, multiple sclerosis, um, you know, decreased immune response is that, um, you know, uh, we also lose our circadian rhythm. Um, so that can also uh, be associated with mental uh, illness, uh, irritability, fatigue. We know that people that live in northern uh, countries, less sun exposures, tend to have more depression. Hemoglobin that carries our oxygen requires a, a UV light to, to bind the oxygen, so we need some light. We're, we can't be bats. So in order to effectively deliver oxygen our tissues, it's better. So when you're outside exercising, again, you, know, you, you have better, better oxygen delivery than in a dark fluorescent light-filled um, gymnasium. So it's summertime, and I'm all about the sun. Again, be smart. Uh, you know, we're not trying to get people burned like a crisp. I certainly don't want to see people with blisters. Um, but don't be afraid of the sun either. Uh, I've said on podcasts before, you know, eating a healthy plant-based diet, high in vitamin C, also decreases the risk of sun exposure. Drinking alcohol when you're out in the sun increases your risk of burning. So there's so many factors besides the sun that cause problems. Um, for us to blame something, uh, you know, that is potentially so healthy is, is not, not so good. So with that, um, I'm going to close down for the evening, and I encourage you to uh, eat a wide variety of seasonal fruits and vegetables, organic. Get out and move your body. Um, who knows, maybe um, uh, Bob Becker will be the next guy to inspire somebody to take up running. Who knows? Hope to have him on the podcast soon. Have a good evening. Thank you, as always, for listening. If you want to email me, jamie at drdelaney.com, J-A-M-I at drdelaney.com. Um, you can go visit our website at drdelaney.com, D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y.com. Uh, we have a newsletter that goes out every month uh, with uh, um, some health topics as well as recipes, so you can go over there and sign up. Again, thanks for listening. Uh, see you next week.